People are gonna really hate me for this, but. Hello and welcome to episode 470 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox. With me is Ben Olson. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. You can be LSAT famous on both shows, uh, share news and ask questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. Go to LSATdemon forward, uh, LSATdemon.com forward slash free if you want all kinds of free resources, invitations to free classes, uh, just really a wealth of free LSAT help is available at lsatdemon.com forward slash free. If you're studying for the LSAT, if you're listening to this podcast, I can't imagine doing that without signing up for a free account. Can you, Ben? That no. Seems that's, like a... so free questions, hundreds of explanations. <laughs> yeah, there's lots. The, of ask, the ability to ask our team of tutors questions via the ask button, that's available to free subscribers. Yep. lsatdemon.com forward slash free. Upcoming deadlines, uh, doesn't look like there's anything really to worry about on the immediate agenda. Don't sign up for the LSAT until your practice test scores indicate you're ready to sign up for the LSAT. Um, November registration deadline is not until September 26th, so you've got a few weeks to determine whether your scores justify you signing up for the November LSAT. Ben, what is this thing about center embedding in legalese and on the LSAT? Uh, so my dad, as usual, sent me an article, um, and I thought this one was interesting because I think it reflects things that are happening on the LSAT. The title of this article is study explains why laws are written in an incomprehensible style. Wow. It's by MIT. Um, the authors of the study were, uh, I forgot who it was, but somebody who I think had gone to Harvard law school but anyways, <laughs> the bottom line is that there are a couple of reasons why legalese is so incomprehensible, but one of the reasons is this thing called center embedding. Okay. And that's where when someone writes down a rule or a law or a statute or whatnot, instead of writing one sentence and then proceeding with the next idea in the next sentence, they have a tendency to embed ideas into the first sentence. And the LSAT does this a lot too. And center embedding breaks up the flow of the sentences because it separates the subject of the sentence from the, uh, oh shoot, what's it called? Preposition? No. Shoot, I forgot object. what it's called. But it, mm, well, there's the object, but there's also... It starts with a P. It's the it's the verb and everything that comes after it. But uh, by separating the verb phrase from the subject, you're, <laughs> it's harder for your mind to appreciate what the subject is doing or what is being done to the subject. Um, because predicate. these phrases... Oh, predicate. Thank you. The phrases are coming in and they're injecting themselves. So it's like your mind has to hold this information in place while it's waiting for the other information for the predicate to drop, right? Mm -hmm. And the LSAT does this, and it's one of their ways of making the test harder to understand. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this happens a lot in legalese, and it's why, at least it's one of the reasons why legalese is so hard for people to understand. Mm. Um, anyways, one thing I've noticed, too, is that sometimes you can take an answer choice, especially like a wrong answer choice in flaw questions, and if you take the center embedded phrase usually offset by commas, and you push it to the end or you push it to the beginning, the sentence just makes yeah. so much more sense. Yep. And yeah, anyways. And that, that happens was... a lot in a different context. You know, this isn't within the sentence itself, but talking about it in my double black diamond um, expert level logical reasoning class that I teach on mm. Mondays, talking yeah. about it yesterday that with the students that they, you know, they intentionally shitify the arguments that you're reading on LSAT logical reasoning by mm -hmm. putting the conclusion in the middle. Mm, yes. Very similar yeah. to center embedding, right? Mm -hmm. People are like, how did you find the conclusion of the argument so quickly? And it's like, well, you know, there's only three sentences here. And part of this argument is meant to, to be the conclusion. So what parts yeah. of the argument support these other parts? 
And I know that the first sentence or the last sentence have no special power. They very frequently will put the conclusion of the argument right in the middle. So you Mm -hmm. have to kind of like sort it out and figure out where that conclusion goes. But if you move it to the beginning or if you move it to the end, especially, which is what I would normally do, right, is I would read, yeah. you know, OK, so this first sentence, that's a premise. This third sentence, that's a premise. Mm-hmm. So if we read that sentence and then we read this sentence, then what could we conclude validly from those two sentences? Yeah. Yeah. OK. But what do they actually conclude from that sentence? And then you see the sleight of hand that they have pulled where they make slightly a different conclusion. And then that's your job is to just say, wait a second, not so fast. Totally. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's like this article was all about center embedding within a sentence. Yeah. But you're saying, hey, look, there's this type of center embedding within a paragraph. And that's absolutely right. I mean, it's that's fractals. how. <laughs> it is, though. I mean, yeah. the structure, <laughs> right? Like they're, yeah. they do that in the sentences and then they do that mm-hmm. in the arguments themselves. And then mm-hmm. they do it even in a broader context in uh, reading comprehension passages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they yeah. intentionally shitify the reading comprehension passage as much as they possibly can. They do the exact opposite of what your seventh grade English teacher taught you, you know, mm-hmm. writing a thesis sentence at the top and recapping that thesis at the bottom and then developing that thesis in the middle. That's not what happens in LSAT reading comprehension. Rather, they just start off with some random shit and then they just eventually get into, you know, it'll be like the first the, it'll be like the second sentence of the second paragraph or something. And all of a sudden you'll start to sense the Oh, whoa, wait a second. That sounds like the author's opinion there. Like, yeah. okay, that's what they're really trying to convince me of all this other shit. They were meandering and they didn't really get around to it. But then finally they got to the point you can then de shitify the passage by kind of rearranging it in your head. Like, okay, well here they were saying all this stuff because they wanted to support. Ultimately, this is the point that they were trying to prove. One thing um, before we move on, we will link to this story. Um, It's, it is written by MIT and it's on this shitty website, fizz.org that is giving Mm. me all kinds of crazy ads and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) um, No one's (laughs) curious about this. That's the problem. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) One thing that I noticed from this is, and it's right at the top of this article too, Mm. MIT cognitive scientists believe they have uncovered the answer to the question, why are legal documents written in a style that makes them so impenetrable is the Mm -hmm. question. MIT cognitive scientists believe they have uncovered the answer to that question Just as magic spells use special rhymes and archaic terms to signal their power, the convoluted language of legalese acts to convey a sense of authority, they conclude. And it goes on and it says it a couple times later, too. It talks about this, um, you know, casting a legal spell. Mm -hmm. And I've said that a lot that, you know, law school is wizard school. For mm-hmm. people who want to cast legal spells. Yeah. So it, it's it's really of pretty limited value, I would say, in the real world. I don't mm-hmm. think that the shit you're going to learn in law school, you know, <laughs> learning to navigate this type of really convolute, like it's useful for your ability to figure out really shitty writing. But yeah, it. it <laughs> It's specific training for people who want to be able to cast these legal spells. Yep. And I have clients. been saying that for a long yep. time. If you don't want to be a practicing lawyer, I, I just can't imagine why you would want to go to law school for any other reason. Yeah. There's so many other ways that you can get yourself experience in the world and connections. And it just doesn't have to be wasting three years and three hundred thousand dollars if you don't want to actually cast these spells. Yep. Totally. My two cents. I agree. This next email is from Anonymous. Hi, Ben and Nathan. Although I haven't yet reached my desired score of 175 plus, I feel confident that I can eventually get there. My diagnostic back in April was in the low to mid 150s, and I've been steadily improving in LR. However, I often struggle with understanding RC passages. I've been told that since my issue with RC is related to linguistic and grammar challenges, my ability to improve might be limited. Is this true? Or can I eventually reach a point where I'm scoring minus one or minus zero in reading comp? I plan to apply not this upcoming cycle, but the one after. 
Is a year of part-time studying enough to master RC? I appreciate your insight. I'll let you respond, Ben, but I want to point out that this is a pretty well-written email. I don't understand why this person would be having linguistic and grammar challenges, at least not from the way that was written. Yeah, I mean, I don't know specifically what you mean by that, and I don't know what the people who told you that had in mind. I mean, maybe it's possible that you have some sort of learning difference that literally prevents you from making progress. But I'm highly skeptical of those sort of claims just because even if you can't necessarily make progress directly, people are amazingly adroit at making progress in other ways, right? Like when they study top performers, sometimes they don't have the same innate abilities as some other top performers, but they compensate by dramatically improving some other part of their brain or whatever. Yeah. So I I would just generally go with the presumption that if you're willing to work at something and try to unpack it as best you possibly can, you will make progress. There's a couple of like real big green flags in this email as well. Diagnostic mm. in the low to mid 150s. Yes, very good. Is mm -hmm. money. I mean, that's yep. That's fantastic. <laughs> I don't yep. know if anybody has told you that before, Anonymous, but if you score in the 150s, 150 anything cold is a fantastic diagnostic, and I would expect that eventually you will make it into the 170s. Mm -hmm. The other green flag that I see here is that you have been steadily improving in LR. Mm -hmm. LR is two-thirds of the test. Not only that, but it's largely a test of reading comprehension. I mean, it's not much you, different. It's just no. a shorter version. <laughs> Yeah. It's just a short, there are so many questions in LR that ask you which must be true, which is most strongly supported, what was a method of reasoning used, you know, they're just asking you to represent what was in that record. And when you learn how to do that on LR, you can then directly apply those same skills on RC. Mm -hmm. So totally. you've been making progress, you know, like you started at a great spot. You've been steadily improving on the most important section of the test because it is two thirds of the test. LR. And I have no reason to believe you won't also eventually improve in RC. Stop worrying so much about the minus one and minus zero in RC. You don't need mm. to do that necessarily. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you yeah, you can like what? Why not get a minus three or minus four in RC and still score 175? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people do that. Yeah. So uh, not, not to say that you can't eventually get to minus one or minus zero in RC, but don't get so hyper focused on that specific goal that you lose track of the bigger picture, which is you are generally understanding these questions. You're going to understand more and more and more of it the more you practice it. And yeah, I, I don't see any reason why you can't make it into the 170s. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, no worries. So you pointed out two green flags, at least one, the high diagnostic score and two, the continual improvement in re yeah. logical reasoning. I would say there's a third and that's your willingness. And this is a big factor that people yeah. undercut all the time, but your willingness to take the time that you need to get the score that you want. When people put it on a tight timeline, they give up something that they don't realize that they're giving up. Oh, it's right. Often huge. Yeah. Thanks. I didn't even, uh, right. That, that is also, and that's, it's, I'm glad you pointed it out because that does deserve special mention. Mm -hmm. All y'all out there who think, no, I have to apply this cycle. I'm taking the October LSAT or bust. You know, like I'm, I'm, I, I have a goal and I don't know if I'll reach it by then, but I'm taking the LSAT no matter what. You, you are at a serious disadvantage against an applicant like this. Mm -hmm. And you're just voluntarily putting yourself at that disadvantage. There's yeah. no reason that you have to be disadvantaged, but you will be disadvantaged if you rush into it always. Yeah. And the willingness to take a step back is just like playing the game on a totally different level. Mm -hmm. And so that's fantastic as well. Yeah. Nothing but green lights here for anonymous. Next one is, uh, well, we got two questions here about how to review your mistakes. First one is coming from a non subject wrong answer journaling. Okay. A lot of textbooks slash LSAT prep places recommend writing out the question type of the question you got wrong. So I wanted to know your thoughts on this, given the advice on the podcast seems to go against studying by question type. Thanks for all your advice and all that you do. 
Wow, that's writing out the question type of the question you got wrong. That's simply that sounds like stat gathering. <laughs> yeah. I got strength and oh, that's a strength in question. Let me write down the word strength. And I'm not even sure actually what you're writing down. All logical reasoning questions fall into two broad types. Okay. They are either asking you to represent what the record said, or they're asking you to change something about what's going on in the record. Mm -hmm. Okay. We call that open versus closed. So open record questions are the correct answer is going to either strengthen the argument, weaken the argument, explain a paradox, something like that, where it's like, if this is true, it does something. Mm -hmm. All other questions on logical reasoning are essentially asking you, hey, if these facts are true, which one of these has to be true? That's a closed record. Records closed. You're just going to pick an answer that fairly represents the record. Mm -hmm. I think people pay way too much attention to question types. I, I do talk about question types in my classes because question types can be important sometimes. But man, you're talking about fine shades of distinction between, you know, for example, a must be true question and a most strongly supported question. They're basically mm -hmm. the same thing. Necessary assumption, also basically the same thing. So this idea that like, oh, no, like here, I, you know, I'm good. The, the, like, can you imagine, Ben, if someone told you that they were good at, at must be true, but they're bad at supported? <laughs> <laughs> we get that. Like, and this no, is not. just like the you have to realize that the question types are not evenly distributed. So there's not an equal number of conclusion questions as there is flaw questions. In fact, there are a lot more must be true and flaw questions than there are any other type. So if you tally up your questions, you might say, oh, wow, well, I am struggling more with must be true, but that might actually but it's just not selection be true. Bias. It's just because <laughs> there's so many must be true. Yeah. Yeah. We advocate more deeply reviewing each question instead oh, of yeah. this obsession over question types. Like mm. to the extent that we talk about question types, it's because, well, yeah, they are asking you slightly different questions. Mm -hmm. But if you read the words in the question, you should then be able to pick an answer that fairly answers that question, even without any knowledge of question types. That's why it's such bad advice when LSAT prep out there tells you to read the question first, mm -hmm. people who read the question first and then start spinning off into like, oh, my God, OK, so this is going to be a necessary assumption question. And I'm not good at necessary assumption questions, but let me read this argument anyway and see if I can find the necessary assumption. Yeah, that's so dumb because you're just like it's you're shooting yourself in the foot mm -hmm. and with all this, like you're worrying about shit that doesn't even matter until you just read the damn argument and understand that it's a bad argument. Here's why it's a bad argument. And then sure enough, the correct answer turns out to be related to why it's a bad argument. Yeah. Wrong answer journals. I generally say don't do it. Don't bother. You want to read this next one? It's from anonymous. Sure. The subject is clarification on thorough review process for a new LSAT student. Okay. I've been using a wrong answer journal to track my mistakes following your suggested questions. E.g., why is the wrong answer wrong? Why did I pick it? Etc. However, I've noticed that the demon isn't a huge advocate of wrong answer journals or spreadsheets. Could you clarify what you mean by thorough review? If not note taking or recording my process, how should I absorb and apply what I learned to future questions? Is it just reading and listening to explanations and then moving on? No. Um, sorry, I'm answering your question already. Uh, What's interesting here, and I'm sorry, Nathan, I'll give you a chance to respond, but I, I just have to jump in here. You're giving us two sides. You're giving us the two extremes. One is where you write everything down, and the other is where you just passively yeah. listen and then move on. Right. And you do need to articulate answers to these questions. The difference is just don't waste the time to write it down. You need to articulate the answer and verbalize it. You might even just say it out loud to yourself in a vacuum. That's fine. Say it in a way that now things click. But once they click, you're good. Yeah. Um, as a thought exper experiment, you know, mm -hmm. I always invite my students to, do you think you could explain it to me? Yep. To my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Why is the right answer right? Why didn't you pick it the first time through? And frequently, the answer to that is going to be, I misread it. 
I didn't read the passage carefully enough. I didn't realize what the last sentence was saying. I didn't realize what the question was saying. Yeah. I didn't read the answer correctly. You know, the, the, there's yeah. many opportunities to misread. And so many mm -hmm. times you're going to just be like, yeah, I didn't read it properly. Okay. Well, yeah. remember that because that's never not going to be true at all levels. Half your mistakes at least are going to be from just, you misread something. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's true on day one. And it's true on day 101. It's yep. true when you're scoring 130 and it's true when you're scoring 170. At least mm -hmm. half your mistakes are going to just be, well, I misread something. OK, well, yep. what did you misread? Like, you know, just you don't have to write that down, but it's like, OK, well, <laughs> lawyers don't misread shit like that. So this is mm -hmm. lawyer shit. So start reading better. Mm -hmm. Read more carefully. That's one of the most important things we have to teach you. Yeah. Um, but could you explain to me why the right answer actually answers the question? Could you also explain to me why the wrong answer you picked does not answer the question? There is a reason why that answer is conclusively wrong. Mm -hmm. And it like on a must be true question, it's just going to misrepresent the record. But that's not what the record said. Yeah. Can you show me why the record said this thing and then this answer says a different thing? Do you understand why that's wrong when they're asking you which one must be true? Yeah. And if if you can do that. To my satisfaction, you know, do this in your head, because I'm not going to be sitting there with you <laughs> unless you're in my classes. Um, you know, do you do you think you could convince me that you understand why the right answer is right and why the wrong answer is wrong? I don't need you to write anything down, but I do need you to do more than just sit back passively and read the explanation, watch a video explanation. Like that's not necessarily good enough if you don't think you understand it to that degree that you could explain to someone why the right answer is right and why the wrong answer is wrong. Totally. So that's the halfway here in between anonymous's two extremes. Exactly. Cool. I do. I do want to say something about um, the wrong answers, which we talk about a lot on this podcast. We say, hey, look, the wrong answers are demonstrably wrong. And I think that can create some confusion. So okay. I want to talk about them in the context of a strengthened question. A strengthened question says something like, which one of the following if true most strengthens the argument, mm. right? And a lot of times the four wrong answers are wrong in such a way that none of them could work. So if you got rid of the correct answer, there none no of answer. the remaining answers would strengthen the argument. At there all. Are, at all. There are some cases where one of the wrong answers would strengthen the argument. It just doesn't strengthen it as much as the correct answer. Now, I think there's two problems with that. And that is one, that students tend to overestimate the number of times that that happens. But yes. two. For sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the burden of proof should be on you, the student, to explain to me why that's a second best answer. Yeah. Presumably it's not right in class. People frequently are like, well, yeah, but why not be? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, why be you tell me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can see why D definitely helps this argument. I read B and didn't think it helped the argument at all. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me why you think B helps. helps this argument. And then imagine what I would say if I were the prosecutor of this argument, mm -hmm. if this was my argument, and you said B to me as a strength, as a weakener, let's say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would I say back? Or if this was your argument and you said B to me as a strengthener and I was the defense attorney, mm -hmm. what would I say to get out of that? And if you can hear me saying back something cogent, then that's probably not the answer. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, so to quickly recap, there are a, a lot of times those answers don't strengthen at all. But when they do, there is a concrete reason. There is a word or phrase that you can point to that makes that clearly weaker of an answer choice. Yeah. It's not a feeling. It's not, oh, it's a better fit or that's a worse right. fit. It's like, no, that answer choice said some, which just means at least one person who yep. the fuck cares about one person when the correct answer just said most or all people have this characteristic. It's a slam dunk and it's a clear, bright yeah. line. And right. that's what I want people to understand. 
is that yeah. either it's wrong for a bright line reason because it's it doesn't even work, or it's a bright line reason because it does strengthen, but clearly not as much, and it can't. Yeah, it's not a test of second best. Yeah. Almost always, there are four clearly wrong answers. Like, it just does not do anything to this argument. Mm -hmm. And one that does. There are a few, you know, sometimes, once in a while. These are definitely the harder ones, by the way. Yeah. And, you know, the majority of your points are going to come from the easy ones. So don't mm -hmm. worry about this too much because you just need to nail the easy ones. There's like 20 easy ones on every section of logical reasoning. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be concentrated near the front of the section. So slow down. Make sure you're getting those ones right. And then, yeah, there will be one or two harder questions where there's an arguable, you know, like I can see why it's at least attractive to some people as a second as a second best. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's just it's really pretty rare. <laughs> you know, people are like, well, well, but if D wasn't there, then B would be the answer. Right. And, yeah. and I, I, I read it again and I'm like, mm, not no, no. I don't see how that really does anything. Yeah. Almost always. Yeah. But even if it does, the point is, is that there is a word or phrase that you can point to that, that makes, makes it that 100% worse. worse. And so yeah. then it becomes clearly yeah. wrong for that. It ain't reason. close. Yeah. It's not like two runners in the Olympics and they're, it's like, whoa, did they, did they pass the line? Like, no, Photo this finish. person is yeah, yeah, five seconds back. And <laughs> the race, everybody's already <laughs> right. on to the next event. And then they come across the finish line. Distant, distant second. Yeah, yeah. Not, not close second, distant second. Okay. Okay. Next one's from Anonymous. Should I apply in September with a potentially subpar to good LSAT and rushed addendums slash essays or wait until late October with a great LSAT and more fleshed out personal statement slash essays slash addendums? Question mark. Do or, we even need to read the rest of this? <laughs> you need Honestly, a third option. Yeah. I mean, the answer to that is third option. Push it to the next cycle, dude. What are you doing? Why yeah. are you doing this to yourself? You're forcing yourself onto a timeline that just isn't the best timeline for you. You know that you do not currently have your best LSAT on record. Pressuring your October exam is not the solution to the problem. OK, so applying in September with a potentially subpar to good LSAT, terrible plan. Pushing to late October, expecting a great LSAT and better essays and all that. Also a terrible plan. I agree with everything you're saying. We should keep reading this because this person does have a change between August and October, but it's still. Yeah, anyways. I expect my LSAT UGPA to be around 3.0 to 3.2. OK, that ain't good. Like nope. you're, uh, you're relying heavily on your LSAT for your law school admissions. The schools I will be applying to are between 20th, like Wake Forest, Texas A&M, Georgia, and 50th and 60th, like Florida State, Colorado, and Baylor. I expect my August score to be between the low to high 160s. I was approved for accommodations for the October test. Oh, God, which is why I'm seeking your advice. I see. With accommodations and the extra time to study, I expect to be at least in the low 170s. <laughs> yes, because time and a half is wildly Overkill. overpowered, <laughs> as we have yeah. talked about many times on the podcast in the past. If you can get time and a half, it's just unfair. It's it's ridiculous. And for a student like this, it's just absurd. Um, not to say that there shouldn't be accommodations at all. I just don't think that time and a half as a default minimum is the right solution. But anyway, um, OK, so, yeah, I agree with you. You're probably going to bust into the low 170s. Uh, and that would be significant considering my UGPA and the range of target schools, along with potential scholarship offers. What do you guys think? Which is the lesser of the two evils? Oh, acknowledging that it is that both <laughs> plans are dumb. Yeah, they're both evil. OK, like yeah. I have to choose one of these terrible punishments for myself. Which one is the least bad, even though there's a very easy solution to avoid both punishments? Yeah. OK, well, it's an easy answer. If the only two answer choices are August or October, you should 100 percent wait until October 
and apply with a wildly higher LSAT score. But our, again, our preference is that you just wait until next cycle. Why not get the benefit of both worlds? Get the benefit of a higher LSAT score and an early application and, and you, better essays. <laughs> yeah. And you are risking putting, you're risking putting too much pressure on that October exam. Yeah. Yeah. People it will do be have higher test because anxiety. Of your, yeah. Yep. Maybe you don't. And maybe time and a half is so much wildly extra time that you are just very confident that you're going to score in the low 170s. By the way, that's sloppy. But, you know, I, I just don't. I don't know. I would. <laughs> people are going to really hate me for this. But. <laughs> does this applicant look like a really rock star lawyer to you? No. Yeah. Thank you for answering. Honestly. I mean, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, ins- I'm not like trying to insult you anonymous, but your undergrad grades are bad. You're willing to like, you're actually considering applying with subpar, like rushed addendums and essays and stuff. Yeah. That's not what a lawyer would do. And you seem to be acknowledging that when you apply in October, you're still not going to have like the best personal statement essays, addendums. It's just like, they're going to be slightly better. Mm hmm. That's not lawyer shit. Like, that's not how lawyers behave. That's just not that's just not what a lawyer would do. Not what my lawyer would do. Like, if I was hiring a lawyer, (laughs) that's not my lawyer. And so, you know, maybe law school will be transformative to you and maybe you'll come out the other end acting in a different way. And I think you certainly will if you're going to actually be successful as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But this kind of like rushed, half assed sort of thing is just not how successful lawyers operate. And so I would, yeah, I would strongly encourage you to just decide now that you're waiting another cycle, plan on taking it in October and November and beyond if necessary to make sure that you get, I mean, with time and a half, you should be scoring in the high 170s. Yeah. So, and this is the other idea I wanted to say is that even though your October test score will almost certainly be higher just because of the extra time that doesn't make it great. Right. And you need great because (laughs) yeah, you could do even better if you leverage this accommodation in September and November until you got a really stellar score. So why not wait, apply with your very best LSAT. Maybe it's mid one seventies. Maybe it's high one seventies. Really make sure that you're submitting solid applications to all the schools you're going to apply to Mm -hmm. apply early in the cycle instead of middle of the cycle. Apply very broadly and then let the scholarship offers roll in. And I really want to strongly encourage you to take the best full ride you can get. Do not get romanced into thinking that it's worth paying tuition at Texas A&M if Colorado offers you a scholarship. It's just not. Yeah, because, you know, like what you're comparing here is mid to more mid, right? (laughs) Like, I guess there is a difference between schools that are in the 20th range and schools that are in the 50th range. You know, that's more than 100 percent different difference in the rankings. Sure. And so maybe there is a substantive difference. But if you would have asked me to name a bunch of schools that are in the 20s, I couldn't have done it. Like are you yeah. surprised like if you would if you would have switched these lists entirely, you wouldn't have been like I wouldn't have known. I would have been yeah. like, uh huh. Oh, okay. So Florida State, Colorado, Baylor are in the 20s. Sure, why not? Yeah. Or Wake Forest, <laughs> Texas AM, Georgia are in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? I, I yep. like I don't think that you're you're just definitely not talking about Masters of the Universe type of schools. And so I think you should not pay Masters of the Universe prices, <laughs> but that's what all the schools see themselves as yeah so just why not kick the can down the road at the at a very least don't apply in september well last question are you an undergrad still oh because i expect my lsac ugba to be around 3.0 3.2 yeah so yeah if you're also forcing in you know a, a final year of undergrad while you're doing this that's another reason that this is just a bad plan Yep. So why would you choose the lesser of two evils when you have the ability to choose no evil at all? 
<laughs> yep. All right. This next cool. one is an ask button question about comparative reading comprehension passages. Okay. I've struggled with these comparative passages and I'm curious how to, I'm curious to know what you personally do after reading passage A. Do you re recap the nitty gritty details or do you focus on the main point? It may seem obvious to say the latter, but I find that comp comparative passage questions often require you to know what specific thing was in passage A, but not in B or both. I think I do that more while I'm reading passage B though. I don't know what similarities and differences there are going to be until I read passage B. Mm -hmm. So I think as I go through passage B, I am like when they say something that echoes what was in passage A, I note that. And when they say something that goes against what was in passage A, I note that as well. Not, but when I say note, mental note, I'm not <laughs> writing anything down, just mental note. But I don't, yeah, I, I definitely don't, after reading passage A, go back and recap all the details from passage A. Yeah, and I think this is just a fundamental misunderstanding. We don't ever really do that in logical reasoning or reading comprehension. We do that as we go. Right. It's the grappling with each sentence and saying, what the fuck are you saying? Yeah. That is, that is dealing with the nitty gritty and then That's it a good sears point. it into your mind. Right. Because I was talking about how I really notice as I'm reading passage B, mm -hmm. the similarities and differences with passage A. But that's because when I was reading passage A, I noticed what the fuck it was talking about. As you were reading. Yeah. In every sentence. Yeah. And I'm comparing the second sentence to the first sentence. And I'm developing meaning as I go. I'm like predicting about where I think it's going to go next. I'm revising those predictions as I get deeper into the passage. And I'm not memorizing all the details, but I am paying attention to an argument that is what, Ben, eight sentences long? At most, yeah. Right? In passage yeah. A. So yeah. it's just, it's not like I don't need to break out a journal to keep track of all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need a database in order to track all of the nitty gritty details of passage A. We just need to read it carefully enough that those things go into your brain. Mm hmm. I think that's okay. good. Yeah, that's good. So uh, in episode LSAT Demon Daily, episode 896. Jesus. That's Jesus. a lot of episodes. That's a lot of episodes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK, so apparently there's over almost 900 episodes over there. Yeah. Uh, enjoy. Good luck. Um, we asked a JAG applicant whether they could defer their FLEEP. That's funded legal education program eligibility. Okay, so could they delay it another year or something? An LSAT Demon student is very familiar with FLEP. Is that how they call it? I would say FLEP, but FLEP, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's it's spelled FLEP, right? I thought for yeah. some reason they say FLEP. But anyways, oh, really? FLEP, yeah, I don't know why. Uh, who knows? Because of their job in the military. They followed up with more info on our Discord, and we're going to show that here. Okay. Nice. Okay. Um, by the way, something I wanted to say earlier, and I forgot to say it, uh, to the two questions that we had earlier about reviewing mistakes, I wanted mm. to say more about that. I was inviting you to participate in a thought experiment where you imagined explaining a question to me. Mm -hmm. You don't have access to me except for in my classes. Yep. You do, though, have access to study partners. Unlimited study partners out there in the world. You have so many fellow travelers on the LSAT journey. Yeah. And our LSAT Demon Discord is a great place to meet fellow LSAT travelers and get all kinds of information. And if you can get yourself a study partner that you can try to explain questions back and forth to each other, you know, maybe mm -hmm. one of you got it right and the other one got it wrong. Maybe the one who got it wrong on review tries to convince the one who got it right that they actually understand it. Yeah. Or the one who got it right can explain to the one who got it wrong. Here's why that answer is wrong. Here's why that answer is right. And, you know, that kind of thing you can really do with any other human, even if they're scoring wildly lower than you on the test, you can still work through questions together. And as you try to articulate 
okay, here's what the record said. Here's what the question's asking me. Here's why this answer does answer the question. Here's why this answer does not answer the question. As you try to grapple with that, you know, your, your study partner could be scoring 170 or they could be scoring 130. And I think you still benefit from that conversation. Totally. So all demon students have access to our discord and there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on over there. Mm. I wanted to make sure that our, our, at least our students are, do, are using the discord and connecting with each other, finding study buddies so that they can have these kinds of conversations. Yeah, right. and the way with the way to find that is to go to the dashboard and then just go to the bottom of the page and there's a join Discord link there. Great. Okay. Um all right. So about this uh FLEP or FLEP, funded legal education program mm -hmm. and whether that can be uh deferred. Yeah. Someone on our Discord wrote, you can defer for up to one year with the approval of TJAG, which is the one star general in charge of the JAG Corps, unless you get promoted from 03 to 04, which is captain to major, which is incredibly unlikely in six years. Parentheses. Or if you hit six years. <laughs> okay. So you get to practice your legal skills just unraveling these <laughs> arcane restrictions. But apparently, you. If you get this approval, you can defer to up to one year unless certain things happen. Hmm. Yeah. If you hit six years, you're done. So out, outside the six years, sorry. Hmm. Same for enlisted E5 to E7, which is sergeant to sergeant first class. It's also contingent on keeping a secret clearance or higher. Lots of contingencies. I'm sure that if you're in the military, you're familiar with this type of shit and you can figure mm -hmm. all this out. Mm -hmm. uh, it is interesting. Uh, there, so there is a one year deferral to Jack. Mm -hmm. I have seen many lose their ability to flap or fleep because it becomes flagged for various reasons. Because of these factors, even though it could be best for the applicant to defer, sometimes they don't want to. There's also the very slim chance of retaking the LSAT and losing your FLEP status if you do very badly. You must report all your LSAT scores to the FLEP administrator at the Pentagon. And if they see something like that happen, they can revoke your FLEP eligibility. Hmm. That's interesting. I can see that now being a reason for some applicants to be wary of retaking the LSAT if they already have a good score. Like if you already have a good score and you're already into FLEP, Maybe scoreboard, like don't worry about going to a better law school. That said, <laughs> your practice tests are going to give you a really good idea whether you're going to score higher on another official test. Mm -hmm. So like if your PTs are seven to nine points higher than your highest LSAT on record, mm -hmm. the risk of you scoring lower on an official test is pretty minimal. I pulled seven to nine points out of the air, but I mean, you know, any significant, yeah. if you're, if you know, based on your current practice tests that you're probably going to score higher, well, you're probably going to score higher. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that unless, you know, your practice tests don't indicate that you can score higher, <laughs> then maybe don't take it again. Okay. Uh, some other info related to JAG is below. Ben, you can just stop me if you feel like this is too much, but okay, when, sure. when it comes to applications, TJAG has the final say in where the applicant goes to law school. You can apply okay. broadly, but there are some schools TJAG will not pay for. TJAG also reserves the right to say, for example, I don't want you to go to Stanford or Yale or whatever, because I think that you would fail out of that school. Now, that's weird. That to me is really weird. I don't think that's why they would tell you not to go to Stanford or Yale or whatever. Hmm. I think they might tell you not to go to Stanford or Yale or whatever, because you would then realize that you have bigger, better opportunities than JAG. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, if you got into those schools, they believe you can make it. <laughs> yeah, nobody fails out of Stanford and Yale. I mean, nobody fails out of law school. Pr pretty much nobody fails out of any law school. Period, the only yeah. law schools that people fail out of are really low ranked at law the schools bottom yeah. where they're worried that you're going to fail the bar. I mean, that's the only reason because law schools want your money. And especially, you know, if Uncle Sam is footing the bill, those law schools are not failing you out. You can get C's in law school super easy. Trust me. 
I mean, it's just not hard. You do anything and you get C's. They want okay. you to keep coming to their school. OK, while in law school, you must also attend OJT during the summer, which is on the job training. If you fail to complete your on the job training or just fail out of law school or leave, then you could be immediately hit with a debt repayment contract. This is a chapter 50 comma 5001 repayment requirement, and they can be incredibly nasty. I know a guy who went to Duke and he decided he wanted to welch on his FLEP contract and go into big law. OK, here we go. This is exciting. The Army came back with a bill of one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for tuition, one hundred and twenty thousand for living expenses and three hundred thousand for breaking an eight year contract. Wow. The soldier must also report PPTO, which is performance reports. And if TJAG says that the reports are not good enough, then they can also be hit with a 5001 repayment. Hmm. So cautionary tales about JAG. Yeah. Don't try to rip off Uncle Sam. <laughs> if you're going to do this, <laughs> you know, so maybe <laughs> Uncle Sam not so wrote afraid. the laws. That's the problem. Yeah. If, yeah, no shit. If, you know, maybe they're not so worried about you going to Stanford or Yale or whatever and leaving for a better opportunity because they know that they can just take you to federal court and just fuck you completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it might even be like military court. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I don't it's know. Not, it's quick and it's <laughs> <laughs> like, hanging is still an option. <laughs> uh, um, Financial this, hanging at least. Yeah. This geez. is treason. If you <laughs> try to rip us off. <laughs> You didn't I mean, do wow. what we told you to. Wow. Like I get the 180,000 for tuition and the 120,000 for living expenses because that's yeah. money that actually came out of Uncle Sam's pocket. Yeah. But the fact that they're trying to come after you for 300,000 for the damages for breaking an 8-year contract. Yeah. That's that's serious, but they're like, "Okay, you want to go take the money in big law? You can do that." It's going to cost can do you. That. Yeah. Just make sure you're paying what you owe <laughs> we're gonna get our share of this interesting lastly it is not true that you are guaranteed to be in the jag corps after graduating tjag does not guarantee military personnel who personnel who flap the right to pick their branch if they do not have enough jag slots that need to be filled they can put you in infantry or field artillery or finance or whatever i mean i would think that you would have to really piss somebody off in order to be put into infantry mm -hmm. or, you know, <laughs> I would think that if they just sent you to law school, they're going well, to they try to figure out. You. Yeah, they're going to figure out a place where you could contribute somewhat, even if you're just like shuffling papers somewhere, at least, you know, I don't know. I would think that they would put you into some very menial, <laughs> not infantry role. Mm -hmm. Um. If you are removed for whatever reason, it is seen as disgraceful and you will most likely never be promotable again for the rest of the time you are in the military. There are risks that need to be considered when flepping that most people just do not know. For more information, check AR 27-1 chapter 10. And we've got a link to that as well. Thank you very much uh, to our Discord correspondents. Thank you, Eric, for putting this on our agenda. Time for word of the week, Ben, from test 129, passage one. The FCC rejected the petition, though it attempted to mollify the church. And I think that to give a little bit more context, the church was probably the one making the petition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would be so my the, guess. Yeah, the petition was rejected. So the church had asked for something and that request was rejected by the it's court. It's the, or though, by the that makes me indicate without reading this whole passage, the though there makes yeah. me think that probably the church was the one that was petitioning. And again, it says the FCC rejected the petition, though it attempted to mollify the church. What do you think mollify means? Well, this is a great word to look up because it is one that I know, but how clear is it in my mind? I don't know exactly. I know it means to, um, assuage or help or to yeah. ease the burden, right? To make things not as bad as they would have been. So something along those lines. 
I really like the thing that Ala always teaches in her classes of just putting something into that mm-hmm. spot. Literally the word something. Mm-hmm. So to read it again, the FCC rejected the church's petition, though it attempted to something the church. So the fact that there's a though there, like mm-hmm. a but there, means that they rejected the petition, but they did something. For the church. Something good, right? Help them, so, make them feel better. Yeah. I'm imagining something like, you know, well, the girl rejected the suitor's advances, though she tried to mollify their advances by... Or mollify them. Yeah. Mollify them by... I don't know smiling and saying it was nice meeting you on the way out the door you'll make for a great friend to somebody (laughs) else (laughs) yeah by friend zoning the church yeah (laughs) okay so all right so we think mollify means something like yeah appease you said assuage like it's something that's going to be kind of mildly positive where you're just kind of giving them a pat on the back saying like you know you're a good boy but no (laughs) should we read the definition yeah what is it uh okay yeah let me pull it up i got it um it is a transitive verb three definitions Mm -hmm. one to soothe in temper or disposition synonym there would be appease Mm -hmm. two to reduce the rigidity of uh so synonym would be soften Oh, like shaving cream mollifies the beard. Mm, You can mollify your staff with a raise. You can mollify your beard with shaving cream. Third definition, to reduce in intensity, which means to assuage or temper. Mm. Like time might mollify your anger. Mm. As an intransitive verb, it can mean soften or relent. Oh, but that's an archaic usage. Well, whatever. Same, same soften, soften is in both, uh, definitions. Okay, cool. So temper or soften. You can be LSAT famous. Please ask questions or share news with us on our website, thinkinglsat.com or on the socials at LSAT demon. If you have questions about LSAT demon, you can email help at LSAT demon.com. Please check out our other podcast, LSAT demon daily. That was episode 470 of the thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. Bye.